Good um, is it afternoon, um, everyone. Um, um, I'm, I'm glad to be here and to be a part of this. Actually, uh, I, I hoped to join um, the other presentations that um, I think Boomba made and uh, Zachary. I, I couldn't for both of them. Actually, for Boomba's presentation, I think I had um, a class at around that time, so I couldn't attend. Um, but I'm so passionate about open access. Um, and um, I, I look, you know, I look forward to see to a time when open access will be uh, successful um, in Zambia, you know. Um, I think this is, globally, this is, uh, has been um, taken as a major alternative to the traditional way of uh, advancing scientific output or scholarly um, output here. Yeah. So, um, so this is something that I, 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 I hope will become successful in Zambia, you know. In, if you look at other countries, even just South Africa, you realize that almost every academic and um, research institution has an IR of some sort, you know, so for, for them to showcase what they're doing. And um, this, I, I hope in the next few years, you know, it will be the situation in Zambia where every university, every, every college, every um, scientific um, um, or research institution like ZARI, NIS and Malaria Research, all of them in a way should have their own IRs and uh, showcasing what, what they are doing. Yeah. So um, the, the title of my talk uh, is um, Scholarly Communication um, Through IRs and Self-Archiving, really. Um, I'm just looking at um, Scholarly Communication Through IRs and Self-Archiving. And um, IRs are a, I am, major one of the major forms of open access publishing so um the other one being the open access journal um, system so I'll, I'll, I'll show uh, just briefly how that scholarly communication um is made up of um the open access method and the, the traditional method the conventional method that uh, scientific works were, were shared and then with the ad advancement in technology came open access and um, one of the major ways that open access is being implemented is to, through institutional repositories. And one of the major ways that institutional repositories are, are being successful and are, are working is through the practice of uh, self-archiving. So we'll look at um, those things. So, um, you know, by definition, um, um, let me hear. Yeah. By definition, scholarly communication is simply the process of disseminating and publishing research findings of academic and um, academics and researchers so that the generated academic contents are made available to the uh, global academic communities and to everyone else that would be able to access um, the, the publications or the research findings, you know. Um, and so, traditionally, Okay, the scholarly communication pro process um, for, for the findings to be considered authentic and, and, and real, and for the producers of those scientific works to really benefit their processes that are involved. And so the scholarly communication process uh, is made up of um, four to five components, all right? And the first one being registration, the second one is certification, awareness, archiving, and, and rewarding. And um, one of the major things that uh, um, open access and IRs has done, they've, they've, they've really impacted the issue of archiving and rewarding, okay? Traditionally, when you think rewarding, you're thinking you, you write a book and you sell, okay? And, uh, you know, there are stories to uh, scientific works being sold and people making money, you know, and not really, uh, most people have been disappointed, you write, and then you realize I'm not making as much money as, uh, but uh, with the coming of technology, rewarding for, for academics and, and scientists, it happens in a different way now. Um, and one way of rewarding for academics and, and scientists is through 
um, um, recognition, okay? So you write something, you, you put it online, people read it, they see what you're doing, then when there's some project to be done, they'll say, oh, uh, John did this, let's call on John. Then, so rewarding in a way happens indirectly rather than selling, but um, uh, it happens because of impact. Uh, I don't know if, I, if that makes sense. So in, in, in some form of detail, here are the components. Registration simply means, um, you know, it, it allows for claims of precedence for a scholarly finding. So how important is the work that is being done? Okay, once you do a work, the peer review and all these other things, and you're able to say, okay, this work is actually uh, important to be published. A certification, um, really certification is about validating um, the work, okay? It's, this is authentic work, it wasn't copy paste, things like that, okay? So it goes through a peer review process, Awareness, um, so you, you market it, okay? You pr provide means for the academic community to access, to have access to the to, to what is being uh, produced. And then archiving is preserving it over a period of time. So you preserve it, you, um, and, and libraries have done different things to preserve, okay? Before technology really boomed, um, a lot of libraries had, had um, places where they kept certain type of, of materials so that they are used a certain way and they are preserved, okay? But with the coming of technology now, preservation is done through digital preservation, another uh, uh, point of discussion on its own. Then rewarding mostly in monetary terms, but now it has come with open access, rewarding is in, 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 in the form of impact, okay? Impact, readership, H index. Uh, you really get into the academics, you realize this is very important, okay? This thing of being recognized, your work being read, being cited. Um, all right. So this is the conventional way that scholarly communication is really looked at, okay? And, and um, for it to really be seen as authentic uh, way of communicating scientific works, it has, in a way, it has to go through these uh, processes that I've, I've just talked about. All right, now, um, in as much as scientific works will go through those processes, there are, you know, channels really that are used to um, advance what is being published. And um, some of the major channels that are used are when a research is done, an article is... Uh, um, an article is um, taken out of that huge research that was done, and then the article is published in an academic journal. So this is one of the channels. Conference proceedings, we go to conferences to look at what people are, are researching, and we are able to, to find out what they are actually uh, researching. Then there are research monographs, okay? There are book chapters that are being done, research reports. So these are channels that are used to, to produce to produce research, okay, to, to, to channel or communicate research. And uh, the research process um, or the production of a research work will, in a way, generally will involve, there will be someone who will write it, there are editors uh, who will do the peer reviewing and there are publishers who will publish it and the funding organizations, the library, uh, library staff, and um, there are all these people that are involved in producing a work and then it is commun communicated in one of these ways. So an academic journal who have editors, okay, someone writes, they are editors or there's a, an editorial committee. Same with the conference proceedings, there is an editorial committee. Um, monographs, there are editorial committees. Okay, now, with all these processes and the traditional way of communicating scholarly uh, works, one of the things that happened was that the major benefiters of the the, the traditional way of communicating scholarly works were publishers, okay? When authors write and uh, publishers uh, get their hands on either academic journals or conference proceedings or, or books, it turned out that authors would give their rights to publishers and when publishers do the, 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 the process, the work, the publishers would gain more from simply, you know, organizing it and 
um, working around it so that it's finally put out there. Okay, and um, the you know the scientific world and the academic world kind of like realized this and and uh, you know um, started thinking we've got to find a way. Okay, of ensuring that um, the the process happens in a way that is fair. Okay, the reason why academics write in a lot of ways is so so that they influence policy so that they help the society so that people just read their works if you really ask them most academics would be happy if people read what what they were writing but why should publishers really have so much of an influence on this okay so where regardless of the method that you you of communicating you choose here oh sorry uh, so regardless of the method that you choose here you will notice that it can be used, it, it, the work can finally be put out using the traditional method. And the traditional method, in a way, benefited publishers more, okay? And uh, for libraries or students or users to have access to those um, resources, they had to pay. So there were, there were access barriers, you know? This way you're, you're writing your, 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 your assignment or you're working on a report and um, you find this really nice uh, uh, title that relates to what you're working on, the moment you want to open it and you have to log in. So access barriers and paywalls. And um, mostly, most of us, when we, 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 we hit a point where we have to log in, we just forget about that article, you know? And uh, it meant that universities or special libraries or most organizations paid a lot of money to have access to the work that researchers did and hoped that people would access for free, okay? And um, because of that came the open access movement now. So the open access movement, researchers can produce research and deposit it in an IR and within a minute, the public is able to, to have access to that and so the two major ways of having free easy access to scholarly publications is uh, through what is known as gold open access and green open access i'll explain those um in the, in the in the next few slides so this is this is kind of like the scenario uh, the, you know this is what happened um scientific works are being produced mostly most of the scientific research uh, that is being done is either funded by funding organizations, the World Bank, uh, funding organizations like US, uh, UNESCO or the government, okay? And if you think about the government funding research, you are really talking about taxpayers funding research. So this is how difficult uh, this traditional method was. I, as a taxpayer, fund a research undertaking and then researchers do their research, they produce research, and then at the point where I'm supposed to read it, again, I have to pay. So one of the things was that users were more like paying twice for one thing. You, you fund research through payment of tax, but you also pay to read your, what you actually funded. So um, because of that, the traditional me method was proving to be more expensive. Hence came the open access method. All right, and this is what I'm, I'm I was talking about so all these people are involved in the production of um, scientific works but the publishers were getting more out of it okay and in a way they, they were not doing as much you know if you really think about it i think the most important thing about scientific works is that it's being in the lab for hours it's going out to collect data and make sense of it and then you give it to a publisher to publish and then they get more so it, it's logical that it kind of like wasn't uh, fair, you know, and the, we needed a way of uh, making it fair. All right, so um, because of that, there was a birth of open access. And um, this is what open access uh, means. And this is what, in, in this situation, open access came up as an alternative to the traditional method, which is which was expensive and which was benefiting 
um, publishers more than um, the writers themselves, as well as libraries that provide for uh, easy access to the scholarly works that scientists do. So what is open access? I know, I know you, you've really discussed this and, and by now we know what it is, but it's simply free and unbridled access to, to scholarly information. So open access aims to provide users with information and encumbered by the motive of financial gain or profit. Okay, so it's works are being done. Let's give them out for free for the betterment of society. Okay, if 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 universities are producing information and policymakers can have easy free access to it, then the society will do well. Okay, and usually open access literature is mostly digital in form. It's online. It's free of charge, and it's free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. One of the things I've seen with open access literature and students or academics worldwide, I've seen this as a problem. The problem has been on, on copyright. Let me, my experience with my students, for example, you find that um, distinguishing between copy paste and uh, making sense of what has been written and writing them in their own writing, uh, the information in their own way so they don't infringe. Most students don't, don't understand, okay? I've given, usually my policy is, um, I, I don't think, I, I'm yet to familiarize myself with the invest policy. When, when a student is copying and pasting, you are infringing on the rights of an author. And so what I do, I give students a zero and I explain why I'm giving them a zero. And then I ask them to do the work again. The reason I do that is so that they really understand this open access and, and copyright thing, all right? So if my work is going to be put online so that it's accessed online, one of the ways I'll be, um, you treat me well as an author is don't pretend that you've produced something authentic when you have actually just copied and pasted what someone else did. And this is where as advocates of open access in academic institutions, we need to, to pay uh, 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 extra attention, all right? So most universities in the West and even in neighboring countries, and even, even in Zambia now, a lot of universities, that's why they're investing in uh, plagiarism softwares, okay? Because yes, there's free information out there, but we've got to learn how to use it right so that we don't infringe on on, on the rights of, of, of the people that wrote. So one, I, th I thought I should emphasize that. All right, so now, when, when you look at the components of the scholarly communication process and how open access through IRs operates, these are some of the two differences that have been pointed out in the literature. Um, in the traditional method of publishing, Registration is done, right? Awareness is done, right? Certification is done, right? But one of the major weaknesses of the traditional way of communicating scientific works is through the, is, is the archiving aspect, okay? Because a lot of it will come in the form of books and um, a lot of it will, won't be online, okay? So, because libraries will have to, 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 to buy uh, journals and then the journals are shipped, okay? Archiving is one of the major weaknesses of the traditional methods, okay? And this is one of the major strengths of open access publishing and through IRS because with IRS we're working with the institutional repositories and different uh, uh, systems are there, okay? So there's displays a lot and these uh, systems are very good with ensuring digital archiving and preservation of um, scientific works, okay? But the, one of the major problems that uh, open access through IRS has, has had is the issue of certification, issues of authentic, authenticity with regards to what is being put out there, okay? One of the arguments is that if, if, if people can produce works and they deposit them in institutional repositories, then even poor works will be put in institutional repositories. Even works that have not been, have not gone through 
um, peer review processes will be, will be put in IRS. Yes, okay, that can be a problem if, if we don't have a proper mechanism of checking. And this is some, something we should, as, 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 as a group who are discussing this thing, this is something we need to look at. So here is how open access answers this. There's issues of interconnectedness, all right? So if, for example, one is copying, you're copying, pasting, and we use plagiarism checkers, we'll be able to detect that you're actually checking. So one way, that's how, that's an indirect way of, 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 of checking the authenticity of the work that is being done. So you throw your work in an IR and uh, someone can check it against uh, um, plagiarism and you can find that, that's one. But another way is institutional repositories also follow the, 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 the mechanisms of the traditional methods. And this here is how they do it. For me to put my conference proceeding in an IR, it will have gone through the peer review process of that particular conference. So if I, I attend a computer science conference on digital repositories, right? I write a paper, I send it, the, the editorial team will have done peer review. So by the time I'm putting it in the IR, it will have been, it's authentic, okay? That's one. It's the same with articles. If I write an article to a departmental journal, to an international journal, it will have been reviewed. By the time I'm putting it in the IR, there's, there are aspects of uh, authentication. So, um, so these are usually the two major differences but issues of certification and authentication for works put in the IR is actually met in that um, a lot of works that are put in the IR would have gone through the methods of checking for authenticity, all right? Um, so there, I said there are two ways of um, open access, okay? There are two methods of open access. And uh, the first one is known as good open access, okay? So there's what we call good open access and green open access, okay? I'll just share briefly about good open access. Good open access is also called the business model, all right? It's also called the business model. Um, one of the things that um, publishers did when they realized how that open access could push them out of business was to embrace the good open access model. Now, this is how good open access is done. Eh? Um, with good open access, authors pay what are known as APCs, article processing charges, to, to a journal system, all right? And then their work is published there. So good open access is also known as the, the, the journal, open access journal system. Okay, so an author will write a work and then your work is accepted in, in a journal, then you pay an APC, article processing charge. Okay, now, most authentic journal journals that use a good model waive article processing charges for authors, okay? They waive it, okay, because they are looking at the quality of the work that is coming. So they'll either pay for it and have other extra, extra strings attached to an article. So instead of maybe publishing it immediately, they'll say they'll put an embargo period, we'll publish it maybe after six months or after one year, then your work will become open access, okay? Now, one of the weaknesses of the good model is it has brought about predatory, predatory journals, okay? So some, some guys out there have come together, put up a journal system, and they make people pay. So you pay 500 kwacha, they process, they pretend to process your work, and uh, boom, it's published. Okay, so one of the weaknesses, uh, or one of the things that ha has emerged because of the God model. Now, the focus of my talk is a green open, uh, open access model. The green open access way or route is also known as the self-archiving route or the institutional repositories. Now, green has a lot of, the green open access model has a lot, uh, has a lot of um, channels of um, uh, implementing open access, okay? 
Um, but one of the major ones is institutional repositories. But there are other digital archives out there. For example, ResearchGate, Academia.edu, um, Mendeley.com, okay? All those are, are, are operating in the green model because it is you, the author, who's depositing your work there, you're archiving. Or some, of, some people have personal websites, okay? And you deposit, you, you put your work out there. But the major way of the green open access route is institutional repositories and the encouragement of self-archiving. All right. Um, I'll skip that. So one of, the, one of the weaknesses, I think I've already talked about this, one of the weaknesses of the traditional ways of scholarly communication is what is known as a serious crisis. Okay, um, because institutions had to buy, uh, institutions were struggling to afford to buy. And so access to the current and quality work became a problem, okay? Why? Because prices were going high, budget cuts. Talk about budget cuts in a country like Zambia now, in 2020, in July, okay? How much funding goes towards your library if you work in the library? Okay, almost every sector is struggling. And then talk about subscribing to a, to a, to a journal system where you have to pay. And so this, the, the, the old system, the conventional system, the traditional system led to the serious crisis, all right? Um, and so this had a lot of problems. I won't really focus on, 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 on the serious crisis so people could not afford to pay people could not afford to subscribe and so access became unfair okay so universities that managed to subscribe had their students seeing quality works and those that could not had their their students and staff not being able to really have access to the best um information resources and um so again my this chart explains a serious crisis here um this is an example of a university in the years okay as Prices of journals in the blue were going high. Um, funding towards the library was this low. And this is a problem almost everywhere, okay? Journal prices go up, funding is really low, right? So because of the problem of a, of a serious crisis, came open access, okay? Came open access and the major form of open access, gold and green, one of uh, the ones that we are really talking about and the one we should encourage in Zambia is green open access, okay? Now, because of the realization of gold and green open access in Zambia, here are some of the things that are happening. And um, these are some of the observations I've made. At, at the University of Zambia, for example, in my school, the School of Education, very interesting scenario. Uh, Lighton can um, add some, some points to this. There, on the, on the gold aspect, there are a number of open access journals that are being established in, in, in our school at the University of Zambia and in a lot of universities because we've realized it's one of the ways that research that is being done by locals can be put out there, okay? Um, though a lot of people that I've talked about don't even realize that this is actually what they're doing. Uh, okay, so there's a mushrooming of open access journals. Um, Good and bad quality can be can be worked on, um, and then a lot of researchers are seeing that oh, actually, I can have my work published in these open access journals. Okay, and um, I've observed the realization that most researchers would rather have their work online. Seen like this has become a very important thing now. My work should be online. My work should be seen and hopefully cited. Okay, and many departments are, 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 are operating open access journals. The green route, they are, I don't know if I should say increasing number of IRS globally, there's an increasing number of IRS. Um, in Zambia, I don't know if the word increasing is a, a good word because so far I know a few people that are really doing this. Okay, so the, the investor of Zambia is an IR. Um, Zikas is the just established an IR good story. CBU has the, 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 the issue is how good is it operating? I've not looked at it lately. Mulungush University established one. Um, 
I had a conversation with one of the guys there uh, a few months ago. So there's a realization that oh, open access is one of the ways and institutional repositories are important. So um, there's the, at least the number is going up, at least, okay, in Zambia. And then many people are practicing self-archiving. When I speak from the University of Zambia's perspective, like from our school, the number of people, for, for example, that are asking me how, how they can put their work online uh, in the university IR, but also in other uh, repositories like ResearchGate, the number of people that are doing that is very high now, okay? Um, and, you know, there are other subject repositories where maybe a repository that specifically deals with agricultural science, okay? Um, I hope that will come in Zambia. These are some of the extra things that we we'll have to do. So this is the scenario now, okay? A lot of people are opting for OA journals. OA journals sorry, are being established. Sorry to cut you short, Abel. I, yes. I, I, I couldn't resist here. I just wanted to mention that uh, the Department of Library and Information Science does have a subject repository. I mean, it's work in progress, but uh, it is there. We mostly yeah. dump, um, we dump uh, square output generated by faculty staff, but also uh, capstone projects or fourth year projects that are, that are produced by uh, final year students. Yeah. To put it out there. Thank you. But kindly, kindly also talk about just the the the, the open access journals in in um, in the school. I I had um, I had someone I, I, someone was asking for your number actually wanting their journal to be to go online. Just the number of also departments in the school that are having their journals pro provide open access um, resources. Uh, I don't know if you can add something there. Oh yeah, I mean, insofar as UNSA is concerned, we've seen um, a rather rapid increase in the number of online journals that are being set up. I think, mm -hmm. like Abel mentioned, people have realized that uh, that doing away with print-based journals is the way to go. For starters, you're cutting down on cost, yeah. right? You don't have to spend any money now, or at least a little money that you have to, the money that you have to spend uh, on an online journal is magnitudes lower yeah. than what you spend on, on print-based journals, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, there's, there's, uh, we, we have, I think for the first time in the history of UNSA, we probably have uh, the largest number of domain-specific journals now. Yeah. Uh, the School of Education alone probably has uh, maybe close to a dozen, maybe half a dozen journals uh, yeah. available. Uh, yeah. Although, I mean, I was going to leave this until the end, but maybe a topic of discussion, Abel. Yeah. Um, th this idea of, you know, gold or... Green, yeah. Some people say diamond and green and whatnot. Uh, yeah. A story about what's happening with our departmental uh, journal. It's called yeah. Dudley's, uh, it's Dudley's, Dudley's Journal. Yes, the, yes. The issue with that is because it's um, it's completely free, right? So it, there's, there's nothing like uh, people paying for so-called APCs, right? Mm -hmm. Like person fees. Yeah. Uh, what has happened is uh, very recently we needed to uh, make a subscription for an ISSN number. Yeah. And because people are not paying money, we struggled. everyone in the department all the lecturers had to, we had to pull resources from the lecturers yeah. to, you know, so these are things to think about. Uh, yeah. You are going online quite right, but there's, there's still money that needs to be spent. Yeah. And, and um, thank you. I, I'm glad you brought that up. And also how, how do we, for example, how do we tell an author that um, pay, pay something and they still think, they, they, we don't put them in a position where they think, I am, am I being duped or, I'm paying for my work to be worked on because that's what predatory journals do. You know, right. how, how can, the, should we continue with, with, with us as a department contributing something or we can still introduce some form of an APC? Well, so, so the, the beauty with our department is uh, we are fortunate in that we have uh, the expertise that you would need to ensure that the, the, the journal runs smoothly. I mean, there are people that have technical expertise. There, there are people that are knowledgeable when it comes to archiving. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, 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 we don't necessarily need to hire a dedicated human resource to oversee mm -hmm. that yeah. whole process. We can do that on our own. Yeah. But then the situation changes when, you know, the journal is uh, overseen by an entity that is unable to Ooh, ensure that right. the, the platform runs smoothly. Yeah. Uh, so a classic example is um, there's a journal called the Zambia ICT Journal. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, in that journal, authors must pay $100, right? So I've just pasted the link there. 
Yeah. So these are different models that are out there, models that uh, Abdul just yeah. spoke about. And yeah. these, are, these are really things to think about as you're thinking um, about open access publishing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before I continue, it, it, is there any other question maybe that I can we can quickly look at before I um, I think I'm remaining with the with a few points to make then I'll be done anything or I just proceed all right um so this is a situation a number of open access journals are has been introduced but um, sorry sorry yes. Abel. please go ahead yeah yeah I just want clarification on the restoration process you talked about okay yeah where exactly is this process supposed to take place is it at institutional level or the publishers oh okay so um you mean the different components of a scholarly communication process yes all right okay so it's um when when your work is is um is being done okay when when you're publishing your work and you're sending your work to a journal right you send it there then that process begins immediately all those processes that i, I listed begin so if you're publishing your work with unza press the moment you submit uh, in the background those processes are going are going are, are actually taking place yeah so um my answer then to that is uh, in a way at institutional level um because ultimately then your work will you have to get an issn number but for a journal usually it's a journal that will have an, that particular type so there are certain standards that are that are actually are actually followed yeah so it's pretty much just a way of authenticating what is being put out there and eventually um when a work has been produced then it has to be traditionally sold and then the writer gets a cut and the publisher gets a cut eventually okay but now we realize actually a lot of writers in the academic world don't even want those cuts what they want more is for them to for people to know that uh, james peary is actually a, an archivist he can do this archival work because of these things that are online yeah so it's it's these are processes in the background that take place all right any other or oh, i continue okay so um this is a picture in in zambia like this is what is happening open access journals a lot of people are self-archiving but um the picture the picture worldwide is not very good and i'm i think i don't know light on must have um dr piri must have talked about some of these things in class um he's one of those that i like it when he 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 shows the situation so um i've seen him talk about this so i'm sure he's talked about it in in zambia, in zambia the situation is not good with regards to institutional repositories okay um the registry of open access repositories as of 2019 early 2019 i checked the only repository that was visible or that was registered there was the invest of zambia i don't know i don't know if zikas by now has done the registration so i've not looked at this and that tells me that you know the picture is still not very good there's a lot that we've got, we have to do and push this agenda, all of us, to ensure that IRs uh, become a big thing in, in, in our country, okay? Um, so, the only one, as I, I think I, I got this in 2018, okay? This was last updated in 2018, and in 2018, it was only showing the University of Zambia. And in 2018, there was an IR at CBU that was not doing very well. And even the, the Zambia IR, in my opinion, can do way better than it is doing okay so the picture in our country is not good and so we need an arsenal of people that can really champion this this particular idea you know this is a baby that all of us should put our hands together and run with okay in 2020 with the mushrooming of universities in zambia we cannot have one ira 
registered. Okay. Um, so not a very nice picture. Look at Zimbabwe. Like, look at Zimbabwe. I don't know. Just if you look, it's nice, isn't it? You can see one, two, three, four. As long as it goes beyond five, you're happy with your country, isn't it? Let's. We've got to do something like like that. There, there are seven public universities in Zambia now, and um, if we are serious with open access and serious with institutional repositories, we should be able to have seven IRs at least. Then, the major. Uh, uh, top private universities one two three four also should should have isn't it so that's that's my take on that um so the, the picture is not nice okay uh, and if i can just quickly chip in because it turns out that part of what abel is talking about right now links to what zachary was discussing marketing right so you you have to explicitly do the marketing yourself so the repository of open access repositories raw.eprints.org is not the only platform where you can expose your, your repository uh, the number of such places, but what you have to do as a library or as an institution is there has to be an explicit initiative to look at all these different things, which is why Zachary's talk was, uh, was really emphasizing on the importance of marketing your IR. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, with that said, what is self archiving now? And um, as a student of at whatever level, as a student or as a member of staff, this is something you want to embrace immediately, I think. That's how I'll, I'll look at it, okay? Self-archiving, simply the practice of depositing uh, your publications online so that they can be seen, uh, okay? So two major major ways, not, not really different, two major ways. Two, two major ways. Number one, author self-archiving. This is just the author posting his or her work online without uh, publisher mediation. Okay, so you 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 publish in your Zajlis journal. Okay, I can get that work that I publish in Zajlis journal and put it on ResearchGate and put it in the Unza IR. Okay. Uh, and put it so that chances of it being read and accessed are increased. Another one is institutional self-archiving. Same thing, but institutional self-archiving alludes to the institution doing the work. Early, early years of my introduction to the University of Zambia IRA, they were practicing institutional self-archiving because the IRA staff were doing the archiving. Okay, and I think they still practice, practice it now, and a lot of universities practice it because students who submit their dissertations and uh, members of staff in the library of the IR will do the, the, the archiving. Okay, so self-archiving really refers to the act of posting articles, dissertations, and any other scientific publications online. All right, what are some of the things that you can put in the IR? A lot of things. Quick words, you can put what is known as a preprint and a postprint. So a preprint refers to a work that you've probably maybe submitted to a conference, uh, has been accepted and they've asked you to make changes. Okay, so you've worked on changes and that thing that you has not been published you put it there because when it comes published to it will be something similar but different okay post print is what has been published now okay so they've published it you can still get and 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 and, and put it now this is where you also want to just be clear about copyright the copyrights you are giving out when you're publishing somewhere okay um, before you publish read and understand what 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 is your take on open access Okay, one of the questions that a lot of the, the, the open access week we had in 2018, one of the uh, people from uh, natural sciences asked me, I have a lot of work published and I don't understand the copyright. Okay, so he actually said, you know what, young man, come, let's go to my office. So I went to his office and he's telling me, look, I have a lot of things I published and I, have, I, have, I don't understand uh, what I gave out. So some of the things you can do as a, a proactive library will find out, for example, on behalf of staff, begin to find out some of the major publishers, okay? And then they'll tell you, 
or you realize that a lot of old publishers will have accepted and embraced open access publishing and it, that it will be fine for the works to be put online. Okay, so you can put conference papers, you can put book chapters, you can put reports, dissertations, photographs. So there's ETC, okay, um, you can put a lot, but this also goes with the policy of the institution. So a policy can have a restriction, it can restrict, okay, you can only put A, B, C, D, all right. So uh, as, as, as you think about establishing an IRO, when you get a job, where you will be working with an IR, one of the things you quickly want to look at is what will our library uh, put. Um, I'm in touch with a librarian at the Zambia Cultural Research Institute. And one of the things we talk about is how they're thinking, how can we manage the data that our, our, our researchers produce? And um, I, every time my answer is, the moment you have a policy, and having discussed with your researchers, you will know exactly what you want to keep and what you don't want to keep. And researchers will, it, it will be easy for researchers to follow a policy. So um, come up with a policy and decide what you keep and what you want to keep. Um, so there are a lot of, ben I won't really dwell on this. I know this has been talked about. There are a lot of benefits um, that come with having an IR, okay? Benefits to the researcher, benefits to the institution, benefits to the community. Okay, um, so there are all these benefits that, and I kind of like um, looked at them, but I, I won't dwell much on this. Okay, so for the researcher, there's impact, and then the researcher also has easy access to other resources. Now, I, as a researcher, I can easily write an article or do a presentation on institutional repositories because there's a lot of open access resources that I can rely on to, to prepare whatever I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do, okay? Um, the institution is known because you disseminate more information, okay? Um, you, you make an impact. The profile of a university is known, okay? But you also keep information assets of a university and that is very important. Um, so you, your university was established in 1964, UNSA. That's one of the things we boast about. How well have we kept information assets? If we had an IR from that, then we would keep. And so now we begin to talk digitization, you know, but one of the major ways. But going forward, HEA every day is introducing something, okay? Accreditation standards, what, 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 what? I want to tell you something. I'll, I'll speak like a prophet soon, very soon. I don't know when. One of the things the Higher Education Authority will be talking about for libraries will be the presence of an IR. I don't know when, but uh, soon they'll be talking about it, okay? As a university, have an IR or have an IR department. I know, soon, soon. Uh, it might take you five years, but uh, it, this will be the way to go, okay? Um, and uh, Lighton talked about reduction of costs. If you have an IR and a lot of other universities use them, you realize that uh, why channel subscription fees to journals that require you to pay when there are cheaper options, okay? Um, so information is freely out there. Now, what are some of the major concerns that come with self-archiving and using institutional repositories? Number one, quality control. Um, many have argued that poor and bad works will end up in the institutional repository because it's the author, it's you that just deposits the work in the, in the IR. So I talked about those other, um, the method of most work that will end up in the IR, dissertations, the, your supervisor would, would have looked at it. Conference paper, you'll have presented it at, at a conference. Uh, journal article, you'll have um, published it in, 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 a, in a journal, in a journal, or sometimes lecture notes can be put in the IR. You're not the only ones. You're not the only one. Some courses are co-taught, isn't it? So you find that you and some of the other colleagues look at courses and you 
And so quality in a way brings itself, okay? But also have a policy determine what should and what shouldn't go. Um, one of the other problems with, uh, one of the common concerns for most people is the intellectual property rights, co copyright. So publishers, usually when you make an agreement with a publisher, okay, for example, there's the IGI Global or some of these other big publishers, you kind of like get the rights, okay? So they've been transferred. For how long have they been transferred? After how long can, does my work become mine? Okay, am I able to have an agreement or a discussion with the publisher so that I understand exactly, um, I understand exactly what I should do with, 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 with the articles, okay? I remember we, 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 we published one article um, in Kenya and um, none of us even read about the publisher's requirements. We just got a chapter and put it online. And after some days I started thinking, yeah, we've got to really read and understand this book chapter, what it means to put this particular thing online. So you want to think really. Okay, so a lot of authors think if I put it, if I put my work online, maybe I'm violating publishers' rights. And oftentimes you find that publishers won't even ask or ask you about it. I don't know, okay? So also you want to look at your own situation, all right? You want to look at your own. Others also worry that ah, I put my work online. Other people plagiarize it. <laughs> okay, that's why universities are investing in anti-plagiarism uh, systems. Um, one of the major arguments from the, the the people that are so argue so much about the traditional method is that self-archiving undermines the tried and tested method of publishing. Okay, uh, how you know? You, you write something and then you put it online. Okay, but that is the argument I was making. Um, a lot of the things that will end up in the IR would, would, would have gone through the same process that the traditional method will, will, will do. You publish in a, in a journal and then you get your article and you put it online, okay? Um, a lot of researchers will complain that I don't, I don't have the time to, to, to self-archive. I don't have the time to self-archive. That's why it's important that, that as, as an institutional library, adopt uh, uh, institutional self-archiving. Do it for, for the researchers because they're they are complaining about these things. All right. So um, recently, we did a, a study that, that um, hopefully will be published in one of the journals at UNSA. Um, and we looked at what are the, some of the challenges or that uh, members of staff face with regards to archiving their work. It was interesting that a number of them said, ah, time, time constraints, you know, I don't have time to do this, I don't have time to do this. Um, time was a problem. Um, I had a few who realized that I have an idea, I, 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 I've, I, I've helped people self-archive who call me and say, oh, I've got this number of articles. Would you help me do 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 this for me? And that's why I am pro. I'm for the idea that the the, the IR department can go around, ask people, bring, and will do it for you. And Mr. Zulu has done that. At some point, Mr. Zulu has actually sometimes gone around departments, sitting down on people's de desks and archiving on their behalf. One of the other problems: lack of technical skills on on self archiving on using the IR, okay? And, and this, is, this is normal because we, we come from different backgrounds, okay? There are some people who are scared of a mouse, okay? Um, yeah, so they will just won't do it. Um, others will argue, ah, they, 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 they're not doing enough to, to help us. I've, I've heard these arguments, okay? And, and people were openly saying the library is not doing enough to support. Uh, to help us uh, do self-archiving. I just don't understand this open access thing and self-archiving. I really, could you explain? And uh, that's what that man, when he had open access week, it was very interesting that when we had a launch, the, the day of, of launching, he came and after I explained something, he said, hey, young man, come, let's, let's go to my office. Explain this thing to me. It was, it was very interesting. I don't really understand this open access thing. Okay, and this self-archive. You mean I can put my work out there? And um, 
There's also just a lot of regret for some of the elderly people I know who they say, I wish I started practicing self-archiving five, ten years ago. My story would have been different. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Um, you know, so people just didn't know. And there's also just a fear of uh, our violate publisher copyright. Okay, so one of the things you want to do as, as, as a knowledgeable person, explain this uh, publisher copyright. Um, explain, okay? Is it possible we can, can we contact your publisher? Okay, write them an email. I'm thinking of putting my work online for free. Can I? And you'll find that the publishers don't even care about it. Okay, then uh, fear of my work being plagiarized. Ah, you know, these students can plagiarize work. I don't think it, this should even come about. Okay, so fear of um, your work getting plagiarized. So, in a in a in a in a nutshell, um, what what a, my presentation was really about. There is uh, this traditional way of communicating scientific or scholarly works. Okay, that has been used for years, and they say change sometimes is difficult to embrace. And then came technology, and came open access, and came self-archiving, came institutional repositories that offer a, a quick, efficient, and cheaper uh, alternative for communicating scholarly works. And it's one for us, information, uh, computer scientists, this is one area that can can showcase our relevance. I know developing apps and what is doing that, but this is an area that is still, uh, you know, requires exploration, and we should jump right into it. So, um, so this is the end of my my presentation. One one of the last things that you want to do to really promote self archiving and use of and institutional repositories, develop policies and mandates. I'm glad Mr. Zul was, taking, was talking about uh, the policy at UNSA uh, being successful. I asked him one question though. I said, so what is your next plan? You know, what is the next thing you're doing? I was, you know, so like, what's an, it, it has gone through, what's the next thing? And Mr. Zul was like, it, it, you know, it has gone, it has gone through. I said, the next thing is let's market it. Let's, we can have a, we can call for a public meeting so that lecturers, researchers know what is expected of them based on what the, the policy says. Now here, here is an example of a mandate at um, one of the institutions in the US, okay? So you, you can make a mandate that goes something like, from this time, okay, from 20, two, 2000, so Unza can say from 2020, anyone, employed at the University of Zambia and publishes an article based on research funded by the University of Zambia or Zika's University or CBU must deposit it, okay, must deposit the final version, the peer-reviewed manuscript to the institutional repository, okay, so that it can be freely accessed. So for this institution, they use PubMed Central, all right, all right. So I, I, I strongly suggest if if there's a policy direction and a mandate it's easier for for members of staff to follow because they know that uh, there's something that they, they need to, they're, they're supposed to work with yeah so thank you so much that's really what i wanted to um discuss and talk about all right uh thank you so much abel for that very insightful uh talk really interesting um, here's to hoping it helps to put certain things that we've talked about into perspective, uh, and especially some of the things that we discussed day before yesterday and on Monday also. Uh, those, are, those of you that were probably paying, paying attention to, to Zachary's talk will remember that he, he said that one of the things they do as a department before they upload what Abel just mentioned, preprint or post prints, is they use that uh, web service called Shepa Romeo, right? Uh, and, and what it does is it provides you with a quick way of, um, of trying to figure out whether or not the publishers of that particular preprint or postprint have given you access to archive that content onto your institutional repository, right? So, so many different things that Abel talked about, you know, uh, interesting things about um, various open access uh, models, right? Gold versus green, 
Uh, and interesting enough, he also raised the issue of quality. Uh, I remember having a conversation, I've had this conversation with Zachary, and I believe Abiyo as well, uh, on why the UNSA has decided to pause on uploading student capstone project reports. If you check on the UNSA website, you realize that uh, the last uh, final year project report, you know, those reports that fourth years or fifth years in engineering will produce, the last one I think was uploaded in 2015. So yeah. there are these conversations to do with the quality of output that you're exposing on the IR. Um, and so we'll invite questions. Uh, please uh, feel free and uh, ask away. Thank you.